Now, quite some time after Galileo, there was a mathematician named Kepler. Kepler believes in Galileo's model. However, he makes a realization during one of his lectures where he sees a connection between certain what are called perfect geometric shapes and the orbits of the inner planets. So he feels that this model is correct, just is not accurate enough, and endeavors to come up with a more accurate model. We can see a model of his initial work right here, where we have these domes that are supposed to be transparent and crystal, and a planet would be on that dome. Here we have another dome, so there would be a planet over here, and another dome, and a planet over here, and so on down the line. The size of the dome is determined by this inner shape, which is one of the perfect geometric shapes. The perfect geometric shapes actually model the same shapes that you would see in a typical Dungeons and Dragons dice set. So here we see, for example, a six-sided die shape. Here we have a four-sided die shape and all the other shapes on the inside as well. Kepler spent a lot of time and effort on his model and building it, always seeking out the most accurate and relevant data of the time. And while it worked for some of the inner planets, it kept falling apart when dealing with the outer planets. And the reason for this is really simple. His model was actually wrong. But with each one of the failures that he came across, he simply first did the most responsible thing he could do, which was to seek out more accurate and more reliable data and information to refine his model. And as he does this, he finds more and more inaccuracies with his own predictions and does something that is very revolutionary. Kepler throws away his model because it is not supported by the data and based upon the data comes up with the three laws of planetary motion. These laws are so accurate that we still use them to this day. It is important to note that Kepler wasn't overly fond of these laws that he had discovered, just because they were in direct contradiction to what he had expected. Remember, Kepler was a very religious individual. So, he believed that the universe should be perfectly geometrically shaped. So perfect circles based on perfect orbits because the deity that made the universe is perfect. So the universe would model that. And so the initial model that Galileo came up with just seemed to make sense to him. It just wasn't accurate enough but Galileo was limited on the information available at the time. So Kepler's goal was to just simply refine that model of what was considered to be a perfect universe. So the reality is Kepler's work proved to be something that was in direct contradiction to what he held as his core beliefs. The thing that makes Kepler very unique in this regard is he turned around and basically said, although this violates my core beliefs, this is what the universe does. Because what I believe the universe would do and what the universe does do are two different things. And he got his work done not by eliminating or removing or ignoring data that didn't support his work, but rather by accepting and seeking out as much data as possible. And if it contradicted his work, he would then turn around and try and remodel his work to best fit the available data. His three laws are very straightforward. The first law is that planets do not move in a circle, but rather they move in ellipse. And the sun is located at one of the two foci of that ellipse. Please notice an ellipse is not considered to be a perfect shape. I do not know why, but it's just not considered to be perfect. And for that reason, it already violates one of his core fundamental beliefs about the planets moving in a circle. His second law 
wasn't any better for him in his core beliefs. It was believed that planets would move in a constant speed in a circle. However, not only do they not move in a circle, but it was also discovered that the speed of the planets are constantly changing. As they get closer to the sun, they speed up. As they move further away from the sun, they slow down. He was actually able to come up with a relationship between the radius of the planet to sun and the speed at which they travel. He called it equal areas in equal time. Where, for example, if I was very far away from the sun, as I can see right here, and this is the distance that I traveled in one week, the area of this pi wedge would be the exact same as this pi wedge over here that I would travel through in one week. The only way the areas would be equal is if this tangential distance here is much greater to make up for the shorter radius. And so the planets are moving faster when they are closer to the sun. His third law is actually just a mathematical equation that allows us to make comparisons to the period of planets around the sun and their distances from the sun. It turns out that if you take the period for any planet in the solar system, square it, and divide it by the average distance that planet is from the sun cubed, that is equal to a constant that is the same for all other planets in the solar system. It's been discovered that if you go to a different solar system, the constant here would be different, but the relationship holds true. This is how we can now calculate the time it takes for other planets or objects to orbit the sun, even though they might be so far away, their orbital period could be over 100 years.